All right, welcome to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. Today is a Tuesday, so we're going to do a little ranting and grumbling about politics and philosophy and fitness or whatever. And as we've been trying to do a little something positive at the end, we'll probably talk a little little fitness and or evolution or sex or something, something fun, something fun. We would definitely talk some fitness. But yeah. Let's, let's get the, the crappy stuff out of the way first. So I was curious your take on this. When when this – so the latest scandal to come out was over the weekend, I think, that these texts were revealed between a, a UK health minister. There's some fairly inflammatory stuff there, but much like with a lot of the Twitter leaks that are going on – or coincidentally strangely enough this also happened to the the british scandal happened to coincide with the uh with this leaked document from the energy department of all places saying yeah this this was a lab leak duh yeah and how is this breaking news you know so much of this stuff is and this is what's infuriating to me about uh the, the the lack of accountability from the media and the health officials they'll just they'll just say well the science changed and then pretend they weren't saying and doing the things they did no no the science didn't change the narrative changed mm -hmm. because there were people saying these contrary things from the very beginning and rather than engage them you censored them well it's it was uh what changed was your selective blindness to the evidence that was out there we still can't say 100% it was from a lab, even the Defense Department, or what would you say, the security? Uh, the the latest one to come out was a memo that, I can't remember if it was leaked or if it was foia from the Department of Energy. Energy, that's and, right. And, and they and, were citing the FBI. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the only thing that's changed is your openness to talk about the evidence. Mm-hmm. Because none of this is new. All the information they have is, I mean, if it is new to them, then we need to start looking at the FBI. And then why all of a sudden are they leaking what they're leaking? I did, uh, who was I listening to? Well, the moral of the story, I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about FBI in general. And the agents on the ground, typically, I mean, they're typically just trying to do a good job. And it's it's the the system on high leaking down that's causing all the problems and that might be what we're we're seeing now is some of these people that just wanted to do a good job are realistically trying to make up for not doing something before and the easiest way to do that is to anonymously leak information so um see if i can find it i'm remembering here it is i found come on load all right here we go so you you said something there that of course is is accurate which is the the bias so in in the in the big pile of emails from um from Fauci one of the interesting things to came out come out is that Fauci commissioned a study to debunk the the lab leak so not commissioned a study to investigate not commissioned a study to to uh, look into or evaluate the possibilities no no uh on February 1st 2020 Fauci, then director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and Dr. Francis Collins, uh, then director of the National Institutes of Health, held a call with several scientists to discuss the origins of the virus. A group of evolutionary biologists on the call informed Fauci and Collins that COVID may have stemmed from a lag accident and may have been genetically engineered according to the memo. So he was being told this very early on, and... Uh, 
three days later, four of the experts who attended that meeting drafted research documents, which was forwarded to Fauci upon completion for editing and approval. The paper, later published in Nature Medicine, argued that COVID had mutations that supported the explanation that had been transmitted to humans from animals. So the science didn't change. You're absolutely, the bias changed. You created the science to back you up and prove your point. And we went over this months ago with the uh, with the big leaked memo from the uh, uh, the Marine major who was with I don't think he was with DARPA. No, it was DARPA. I think uh, it was DARPA. Yeah, it was DARPA. OK, so he, he was with DARPA and somebody leaked this memo where he went through and I pulled up some of those some of the documents that he cited because some of them are available. You can find them if you dig about how. There was some funny business going on at the NIH to circumvent the uh, the ban on gain of function research. That they would that NIH was giving grants to this group, Eco Health Alliance, and then Eco Health Alliance was going to Wuhan and partnering with them to do this research, so that the NIH could get around at at the time the ban on um on gain of function and they were proposing eco health proposed to darpa a uh a study an experiment to do gain of function on bats for coronavirus that was exactly this and so this guy was saying hey we need to look into this because we may be treating things on a totally false assumption. So all of this was out there. You just weren't allowed to talk about it. The science didn't change. The politics changed, which just goes to show that the science was always just politics. It was always just an appeal to authority fallacy to politically get you to shut up. I just had, I just had a thought on what you just shared. Uh, Give me some keywords. I got the Fauci deposition up mm. to search for if he was asked specifically about these emails. Let's see if we can. Uh, find you can try Lab Leak. Or you try Wuhan Lab. No, Wuhan Lab only brings up one. Let's see. Uh, nature paper. Nature Medicine was Nature the... Nature Medicine. Ah, Exhibit 4, Nature Medicine article. Yo. So it was an exhibit. Did they actually ask okay. him about it? Yes, they did. Oh, my. This Here should... we go. I'm giddy with excitement. <laughs> hey, did you see this Nature article? Yes. Were you familiar with this, this article, when it was... Oh, this might be a different one. Dang it. Thought we just caught okay, him in 2015. a Okay, 2015. Yeah, dang it. But there's a lot of I don't recalls here. Ah, okay, so this is Ralph Barrick was the I think I, he was with EcoHealth. I think he was the head honcho at EcoHealth Alliance. Dazic was the head. Oh, Dazic. Who was Barrick? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, he's funded by NAID, according to this. I know that name. Do you ever remember it's meeting with up. him in person? Again, I don't recall. No, nope, they were emails. Yeah, I think Barrick was all part of this, too. I think he was on the list of people in the emails he was involved okay he's the he's the north carolina um professor an epidemiologist who was doing work on um corona uh, coronaviruses in bats um so he was linked to all this but again as we talked about before don't recall don't recall don't recall Hmm. I don't know how this ended up. 
in looking for this, I found a, an article, a news article that that Barrick and Dazic were being sued as being responsible for deaths to COVID. Curious how that turned out. Probably not well. Um, well but I, the uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's if you go to the CDC, you can find a movement or a something called One Health. And it's basically the merger of public health, environmental health, da, 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 all down Ugh. the line. It's a basically stakeholder uh, medicine uh, all the way down the line. And the people who wrote the uh, backbone documents for that were <clears throat> Eco Health, health Alliance. So yeah, just, of- just search One Health CDC. And you'll get everything. Funny how this all, all, all this stuff kind of circles back to each other. Uh, it's almost, it's almost like there was a, uh, a plan in place that, uh, to, to use a crisis to, uh, redo things or perhaps reset things in a different way but that was just, just, just got a little wild tick. conspiracy you should you should do some mobility work on that left scap there trying trying to figure out what's going on mm, yeah. I, I i love that the great reset is just a conspiracy he literally wrote a book well that's a good segue because we've got another book that was written which is what brought this up and it was about this guy in fact he wrote the book with someone else who he picked the wrong person because she decided to leak all his messages that she had access to because she was writing a book with him. Uh, and this is what you wanted to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is the guard. So picked a very not right leaning source for my information here. Cause I knew you'd probably have the telegraph articles if you had anything up, but uh, yeah, the, he was writing a book on his way out uh, as I'll give an American example of this on the other side of it, as Fauci will probably do. I guarantee you there's a memoir of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic through Fauci's own eyes. That's going to come out mm-hmm. in the next year or two. It's probably already being written uh, because, you know, anybody that thinks Obama wrote his own book, he did not write his own book. He had writers writing his book and he was giving, giving them notes just like Bill Clinton did just like, every other famous figure that yeah there's this this is something that annoys me and i can't remember what prompted this thought the other day and i didn't mention it um when we were talking but this this is just this is legalized bribery is what it is this is why politicians and officials always write books because you can get a uh a friendly group to buy a big chunk of these books for you and it becomes legalized bribery. So they can't just write you a check. So if, if you're Bernie Sanders is what it was, is because I listened to Bernie Sanders on Ma- uh, Maurer's show, Bill Maurer, Bill Maurer. Yeah. And so if you're a lefty like Bernie Sanders, then the unions will buy thousands of copies of their book for you and then just, you know, give it away to their members um who otherwise wouldn't have bought it and because they can't just write bernie sanders a check for a couple hundred thousand dollars but if they buy a bunch of his books then he effectively gets that in royalties or if you're on the right maybe a christian nonprofit buys thousands of copies of ted cruz's book and gives it out to their members yeah it's legalized bribery one of the biggest examples of that recently was a company that has been known to back the obamas bought like a hundred thousand copies of Michelle Obama's book coming out of her uh, first lady ship, whatever you want to call that, if that's even a word, but uh, of course, here's the guardians. You can see the guardians bias just to prove that we're not picking our sources. Hancock has protested that the WhatsApp leaker, the journalist, Isabel Oakshot offers a bias and partial account of his office. Well, if we get the, the actual messages, yeah, there's over a hundred thousand and context matters. But that being said, in some of these, you you can't change the words. The context around it is it, still, it, it, they're still damning. Now, one that's out there is when he's kind of poking fun at Bill Gates, and he said, "Well, you know, didn't we didn't we get enough of your microchips in people's arms?" That's obviously obviously a joke that people are running with. Mm-hmm. 
you know, the context around that, he's probably just poking fun, you know, uh, making fun of the actual conspiracy theorists that thought we were getting microchips injected into us. Yeah. But on the other side, when you're saying we need to do X, Y, Z and ramp up the fear on the public to get it done, there is no context that can make those words different. You just said, we need to do this thing that the public doesn't want to do, but we can get them to do using fear. That's damning. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, and, and his, his contention that, oh, well, officials need to be able to talk to each other in private. No, no, no. I, I want police body cams on, on, on bureaucrats and elected politicians. <laughs> I want police body cam so that you're always above board. So there's never a chance to get into a closed door and, and, and talk about who's scratching who's back and how do we advance this agenda, even if it's dirty and underhanded. And we have, we have the technology to, to separate private life. I mean, for you, if you're the top of the top as a public figure, you do sacrifice a lot of your private life, mm -hmm. but you still have family, you know? What what Joe Biden says to Jill Biden is none of our business, but you just firewall that. Once yeah. one, once it becomes private time, you have no access to the things you use in your public life. You only have access to your family, your friends, the ones that have no implications when it comes to public policy. You can firewall that. We we have the technology. It's that easy. You give up a lot of your private life, but you can still have some. You just can't mix them. And if there is any chance that you could mix them, you are out of that firewall. You have lost that privilege. Yeah. Yeah, you you are, you know, to this guy, Hancock, oh, I need privacy. To... No, no. You are setting policy for the millions of citizens of Britain that are going to directly impact their lives to such a degree that it is not hyperbole to say that you're making life and death decisions. Well, you you did you said the perfect example with body cams. A police officer in uniform should have universal body cam on at all times. As soon as you take that uniform off, you lose that power as police officer. You lose mm -hmm. that authority and you can go home. You do not have to have public access to your personal life. In uniform, influence over the public because of your authority no privacy i don't care if you're eating a donut sitting on the side of the road using your radar or whatever outside of your uniform at home with your family all the privacy in the world you still have influence over the public though and our elected officials and in this the case of our what we call the deep state our unelected officials that have power have given up some of that privacy while they are wielding that authority and power. Yeah, you're 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 discussing policy. You're discussing public policy. So why shouldn't that discussion be open to the public? Well, we discussed this uh, way back when, when we were talking about uh, the classroom, universal classroom cameras. When that teacher has authority over my child, they are public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they go home, they don't have to take the camera with them. Yeah. I I don't see how that is even <laughs> remotely controversial. And yet it is. Um, At least we're consistent. That's, that's one of the points I'm hammering home with these examples. We support universal body cams. We support classroom cams. We support transparency in our public pig figures. So no, it's it's not their right to to keep these text messages private. My frustration with this scandal is again, it's nothing new. Way back, it was either right after he was elected or right before he was elected, Rahm Emanuel, Obama's chief of staff, was on video saying, "Never let a crisis go to waste." This is this is politics 101 for as long as there's been politics. Yeah. And the the more we let ourselves get sucked into it, this is why we started out talking about mob psychology. This is why one of the first things I talked about is I brought up what's his face, the French guy who talked about mob psychology. Well, it's even worse than mob psychology. We have 
we have the blueprint for us and it was written a long time ago. The book's called The Prince. The, the, the Prince predated the idea of mob psychology, but that's what he was talking about was this is how you manipulate the mob. And then later people wrote about this is how you get manipulated when you're in a mob. This is what's happening to your brain. This is how you get sucked in to doing things that if you were on the outside looking in, you would say, my gosh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's how freaking mask wearing became a political issue. It's how the the effectiveness of drugs became a political issue. These things never should have been political issues, but the powers that be would rather you were fighting and arguing about that than actually taking a a discerning look at what they're doing and they don't want you to ask okay is what you're doing actually for the public benefit or is it for your benefit because the overwhelming majority of the time you could say no no this public policy isn't for the public's benefit it is for the policy makers ultimate benefit them and their pals yeah, and this is going to have implications across many, many, many domains because looking at how quickly uh, technology is going, think of something like uh, genetic uh, modification. We have versions of this. We, the CRISPR stuff is still down the road unless it's a single gene, mm -hmm. but but they're still working out the bugs there. But they already do, and they're doing this in China now. It's not quite legal here yet, but the elites are going to go to China to get it done. Where basically they're doing something to the extent of fertilizing 10 eggs to make 10 embryos with your partner and then picking the best one. The most intelligent one, the most, the one that's, that they've mapped a lot of this height, intelligence, uh, conscientiousness, they've mapped. All of these things that yeah. make you successful. So it's going to be, if we, if, it, if it doesn't become illegal here, it's going to be a black market thing that only the elites can afford. And if it does become legal here, do you think that the elites are going to put together a policy that's going to subsidize poor people to get this done? No, we're going to end up with a furthering of the, the gap between what is considered the elites and what is considered not. And... I don't know where we go with stuff like that. That's it's going to happen I, one way or the other. It's either going to be black market or it's going to be accepted. Well, where we go is Gattaca, which is one of the most disturbing dystopian movies I've ever watched because it was so low tech science fiction. The The fiction wasn't that far off. And I mean, the movie is only like 10, 12 years old and we're kind of already there. You know, well, we're right on the cusp of it downstream effects of things that we consider universally good women's access to education women are now outperforming men in education women hypergamy is the concept that women date across and up so your elite level female college graduate is going to pick the elite surgeon or something to marry not joe blow truck driver right mm -hmm. so we're already creating a eugenics movement where we're going to separate because that's that's just picking your genetics. I picked a surgeon because they are they have the qualities to be this elite class member in the society. They earned that. I I picked the high level CEO because of these reasons. Uh, so we already, I mean, this is just slow moving eugenics is all it is. And 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 that leads to something we we mentioned I don't know last time or the time before about the. Uh... Um, 1984 versus Brave New World and 1984 kind of had an element of Brave New World but it was you know it, it, it was background because it was the I can't remember what he called them the the plebs proles. The, the proles yeah so and, and if I remember right the the party was only something like 10 percent of the population mm -hmm. so they they were they were the powers that be and then they lived off of people who were basically serfs but they were kept dumb and happy. They were given bread and circuses. And so the, the, 
the powers that be never had to worry about them rising up like usually happens in throughout yeah, and the history. part they don't mention in 1984 is the selective breeding that goes along with that you've already picked the elites you've already picked that what was the middle class the uh wherever winston was in uh mm -hmm. and they were only allowed to breed with each other they weren't allowed to breed with a prole and the proles yep. were only allowed to breed with each other so all the qualities that made you a prole I mean, he even talks about it in the book. He doesn't say it explicitly, but the way he describes them is you can tell a pro just by looking at them, just by talking to them. Uh, it, there's nothing to mark you other than these immutable characteristics, and you just knew. So there was already a distancing between the different groups of people. And uh, we, we all do it. It's not morally wrong in and of itself. I picked my wife because she was intelligent. At least that was a very high thing on my list, and well, I mean that that was that was something important to me, and I wanted to instill upon my children. But you don't go at it from an elitist mentality. That is, it to, to you that is intelligence is simply a trait. It does not make you a better human than someone else. But, but that high performing female college grad isn't marrying the surgeon from an elitist standpoint either. She's marrying a surgeon because she's impressed by him and she's only impressed by people that are even or above. But there is a section of a I I don't know that the that it's growing in size, but it's growing in power of what you were just talking about with the, you know, the the CRISPR babies, that group does look down on us, the prol. We are the proles to them. They well, are elitist. This is this is what we talked about last time. This is how you can ignore East Palestine for three weeks. We do this consciously and subconsciously. When you're on the bottom, you're always clawing up. When you're up, it's yeah, everybody talks a big game in the elite circles, but nobody wants true equity. Not that's already up there. They want all of us clawing from the bottom to be evened out because that keeps them up there. And it's some of them are doing it very consciously, but some of them are doing it subconsciously. It, it, it's uh, Rob Henderson calls it luxury beliefs. You know, I have all these beliefs that actually aren't really good for people below me, but they sound nice. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole we shouldn't have two parents in the household, it, that's obsolete or whatever. And it, you see, from sexy time with Sam, I even argue for that as part of the the system mm -hmm. because it's better. But these, you you know, the 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 elite girl in college is like, oh, you know, we should be more accepting and da da da, da and you know, that's uh, we just need a better welfare state or everything that makes it worse. And if you asked her, well, what about you? Are you going to get married before you have kids? Oh yeah. It, it you know we shouldn't judge them but this is the way i want to do it because mm -hmm. they can that i i mentioned this months back uh because whitlock uh was on this for a while uh you know using the phrase that the the white liberal elites don't preach what they practice mm -hmm. that 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 what they preach for you know and and he he grew up in the hood he he comes from the inner city black community and so he spends a lot of time talking about that and what's going on there and and what's been going on for decades and so he's he's been making the point that the the white liberal elites you know the the sub, the suburban upper class that that preach equity and and uh you know and all these nice sounding uh, ideas about acceptance and about helping the black community and all of those ideas are destroying the black community meanwhile they're practicing something entirely different than what they mm -hmm. preach another interesting voice on this is uh I'm, i don't want to say former fe feminist because she calls herself still a feminist but she doesn't agree with the current movements but she mary harrington she her book should be coming out in Apparently, it's going to be very controversial, but uh, it's uh, yeah. one of her things is uh, we're basically cyborgs already because just the advent of birth control makes you different than a human. Hmm. 
And all of these modifications, uh, you can't help but support trans rights if you take birth control. It's the same thing. You're modifying your body to make you what you want to be. And if it's someone that can't have a baby right now, even though you're a woman, you're still modifying your body. Well, that's going to ruffle some feathers. That is going to ruffle some feathers. But but she goes on further. It's it, it's it's along the lines of the luxury beliefs. A lot of these people that advocate for stuff are basically completely insulated from the effects of them. You know, birth control actually made birth rates go up because people were having sex willy nilly. And, you know, it's not 100%. And if there's a lot of things, especially in the early days of it, that could affect it. Like if you took antibiotics or something along those lines and that people weren't very well educated on at the time. So all of these downstream effects don't affect the people at the top who advocate for them. Well, it's 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 hard to blame all of that on birth control. It's which came, you know, which no, it's just first. I think it's just one of the uh, most major invention, most the, most influential inventions of the last but the, 100 years. The birth control, I think, certainly um, certainly contributed to the sexual revolution, because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think you have that if you don't have relatively reliable birth control. Well, one of the big things now is we people use the word transhumanism, where we're we're. we're going using the cyber age and all the technological advancements were going beyond being human and her one of her big arguments is we started that a long time ago what what is a vaccine other than being transhuman you have injected something in your body that makes you less susceptible to diseases that would kill you as a human what is birth control other than transhumanism and then you go on and on and on to body modifications and i mean Technically, I'm an enhanced human being because I have a, had a vasectomy. I have overcome nature. I could have all the sex I want without making a baby. You've you've had, uh, you've had, how how would you describe it? Abnormal nerves in your heart burned away so that they don't kill you. Well, even before that, I had a defect in the aorta corrected when I was four months old. I am officially a Franken baby. And this is what has been so infuriating about the reaction to Jordan Peterson since he came on the scene is so often what he has been saying is, look, we have we have these problems here. Here is objective, observable reality. And then the the small minded or the people who know better but want to fan the flames then say, oh, you're pro, you know, whatever terrible thing. No, I'm just pointing out that this exists. You know, when he talks about the Pareto distribution, he's not saying, and he repeatedly says point blank, this isn't a good thing. It simply is. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out as human beings who want to live in a civilized society rather than our, you know, uh, our, our our violent tribal history, which is the overwhelming majority of human history. If If we want to continue to live like this rather than revert back to what we were, we need to figure out how to address these things. You know, same thing with, with transhumanism. I, I like that point that this has been going on for a while because we need to recognize that and we need to talk about this or you get to the book over your shoulder there. I can't remember his name. The, uh, uh, the, the, the doctor professor guy who's like Klaus Schwab's oh, big advisor. Yeah. And he's a, he, he's this Indian guy who is an Uber transhumanism but but when he's talking about transhumanism, he's talking about things, things that will ultimately let people like him control we the proles, mm -hmm. better manipulate the proles so that they can maintain their power and position and wealth. So if, if we don't recognize what's going on, we're going to be led by the nose right into it. Yeah. And, and one point I want to put in here before I try to get us back on the railroad uh, is... I'm not saying transhumanism is bad. I mean, we just you you just brought up a great example of this. I would be a dead baby mm -hmm. if we didn't have surgical procedures that helped kids that were born a certain way live. But at the same time, and even birth control isn't inherently bad. There are just effects we need to address and actually be educated on, including the effect they have on the woman's body. You know, the... Just the fact that 
you could get on a a version of birth control as a female and completely lose your libido. So what's the point of having the birth control if you have no libido to have sex? Mm -hmm. You basically become abstinent, which is the other form of birth control. <laughs> the old fashioned way. The old fashioned way, but that doesn't happen to everybody with all forms mm -hmm. of birth control. So. Uh, how are you going to get us back on track? Because I, I had a, a thought if we wanted to move on. I, I have a, a tease well, uh, I want to make. Well, so so one one thing I want to bring back, because so so the main point about this, this British health secretary is. We, we again, as with the Fauci emails and all of these things, we get another insight in their own words of what they were doing to us. Mm -hmm. We have another version here in the States. Dr. Burks had her book. She wrote about how she manipulated Trump into doing what she wanted. She put it in a book. This isn't even a leak. She said, mm -hmm. I did this to get what I wanted because it's the best thing. I manipulated data. And then she goes on to say that the data is uh, what everything is about. Well, if you manipulated it, then is it really what everything's about? Because yeah. You know, How is that any any different than Fauci commissioning a study specifically to debunk the lab leak? It's worse. You told it you, you didn't you didn't at least that's a little indirect. If you told the president of the United States these are the numbers and he made a decision based on those numbers, that the equivalent with your example would be Fauci saying here is the evidence now write about it. Hmm. It's it's uh I think it's worse personally, but they try to put it in the best light. It was in your best interest. But the the downstream effect of this, I told you Fauci's probably gonna have a book, and all of these other people are gonna have their own books, Francis Collins, whoever yeah. else is involved. I I hate that it happened. I love that it happened so quickly because we needed to know, but the downstream effect of that is they're gonna be a lot more careful about who they have writing these books. They're gonna have some sort of vetting process that is. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not allowed to, you know, even if it's just a legal document that says you're not allowed to, or you're going to be sued for everything you got. So along these lines, um, kind of a tease and wrap up here. So I, I finally finished the, the biography of Stonewall Jackson I was reading, which made me kind of dive back into what got me into history, which was the civil war. And, uh, one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, razor fist, the rageaholic channel, uh, made a rather unfortunate video recently that was pretty bad, uh, about Lincoln. And, and so I wanted to go into that because there, there, there are parallels through history, uh, that we should be learning from. And, the Civil War was the most traumatic event in our history. You know, 600-something thousand men died in it. That was about 1% of the population at the time. So what are what is our population? 330 30 million, million thereabouts. So uh, uh, imagine a, a violent event over four years that kills three and a half million people right it that would be horrific and you would want to know how did we end up here um one of the uh one of my favorite lines from granted caveat i shouldn't have to say this but Did we lose you a Hello? civil war but there's a lot of good the narrator says you know something to the effect that Wait, you, you, you uh, cut out yep. when you said Hello. my favorite hello you cut out when you said my uh one of my favorite okay one of my favorite lines from ken burns civil war is is in the opening the narrator says something to the effect of you know over four years americans would slaughter each other destroy each other's you know farms blah 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 if only to become the kind of country that couldn't conceive about ever doing something like that. So there's all this talk of national divorce and all this other crap. And we are headed towards something like that. It's not going to be that, but we are headed something towards something like that. 
and we are being manipulated into it. And that's what I'm going to talk about is how how the country manipulated itself into such a horrendous tragedy. Um, because there are a lot of misunderstandings and about how the Civil War came to be. And so I've, I'm going to do a deep dive on that, if not next week, then the week after that, uh, and kind of show the, the parallels I see and where we're at. Sorry, I'm having a few technical issues. So you just to... froze on my end, so I don't know what's going uh, on. You're frozen on my end. Can people still hear us? Oh, no, you're not. All right, well... Let's pause for a second anyway. All right. All right. So what what I wanted to tease uh, and, and also kind of tie into what we're talking about is I've gone on kind of a deep dive on the Civil War and the the causes of that, the attitudes of that, and how it is more complicated than pretty much anyone talks about. Um and it's 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 relevant to today because the the country let itself be manipulated into a horrible national tragedy for a few people that it would benefit basically and here we are again same story different verse and I don't know how well that's coming through because you're all herky jerky and keep freezing up on my end. You no, know, the the sound was good, but your video was freezing. And I just got a message that said internet Bye. connection is unstable. So let me pause and try something. All right, all the super serious stuff is done. We're gonna go ahead and do some fun stuff now. All right. So, do you want to grade my homework? Sure. Is it somewhere where I'm going to be able to see it, or you just got to tell me about it? I was going to tell you. Do you want to pull up a an Excel so you can write down this program, or do you want me to? Because uh, I've got it in my notebook here. I'll just, I'm I'll just, I'll just sketch, and then we'll talk it out. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, to to recap a bit, the uh. The talk we had last time was about uh, increasing the volume and lowering the intensity, uh, except for uh, pushes. Upper, upper body pushes. Upper body pushes, because that wasn't as intense on this last cycle. Um, also, because, which works into part of my evaluation because the the kind of the two key things my, i took away from the program was i need to do some work on my muscular endurance uh but i also i made good progress on regaining some balance and i wanted to keep doing that and one of my preferred ways to do that is to do more more volume more reps less weight to really train that movement pattern more um <clears throat> all right so I start off with a pull down, I'm doing a kind of a, a, a basic pull push split four times a week. Uh, so I'm starting off with uh, RDLs, uh, three by 15, then hip flexor pulses, uh, 10 each, and then pull aparts and scap ups, eight each. Uh, my logic there being that uh well the hip flexor pulse is because i sit way too much like almost all of us do and so i always need lots of you know anterior hip mobility work the pull aparts and the scap ups uh that is that is partly extra warm up to get the to get the back opened up to get that scap moving scap better scap ups you mean like in a plank position where you're yep okay yep uh uh, to, Sorry, to difference get... in terminology. Yeah. Even though I taught Heath a lot of stuff, we still learn a lot of stuff from different places too. So we do have different terminology on mm -hmm. some things. And one thing you learn in the fitness industry is there's a hundred ways of saying the same thing. Yep. 
Uh, so, uh, I like RDLs, especially high rail, because you get you get a good lengthening there, and then the contraction. So it, uh, it it really, especially if you're someone like me with chronically tight hamstrings, that really helps loose keep those keep those pliable. Uh, and then the the pull aparts and scap ups, uh, because I need the scap ups because I need some serratus work to help stabilize those gimpy shoulders. And uh, the whatnot. only recommendation I would make there is do the pull aparts and scaps before the hip flexor stretch. Okay, because then you're basically getting a rest for your upper back before you do your next set of RDLs while you're doing the stretch. And the, and the stretch is not going to interfere with the RDL. In fact, it's going to enhance the RDL. So, because you're stretching the opposite side. So the pull aparts and scaps, you could end up wearing out your, the, your periscapular muscles before the next set, at least not having enough rest. So if you flip those around, you get that rest and you should be able to perform at a, it's slightly higher because pull aparts and scaps aren't intense, but. All right. And then the, the next set of exercise I did was uh, a single arm cable row. And I like to do those standing, uh, unless for some reason you have trouble with that, then go ahead and sit down. But I like to do those standing to get the, to get the whole body engaged, to get a little bit of engagement, you know, from the lower body. And that, uh, I think we've talked about this, about how if you look at the body, it's kind of an X where the... Mm -hmm. the this this leg connects to this side of the upper body uh so uh when i'm when when i'm doing high rep um pulls and pushes off of a cable i like to do those standing and get some extra work there uh so i'm doing those with uh the cook hip lift because those were I don't remember the last time I did those before you wrote those into, into this last program. And those were annoyingly difficult to do when I first started off. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of shifting. So I wanted to keep progressing there because by the end I was able to, I mean, I was still shifting. Not every rep was great, but it was a lot better than it started out. So I'm doing three by 15 of all that. Um, and then the next series is uh pull-ups uh something you stole from me which is three sets of three-way <laughs> giggity uh so five reps of wide grip five reps of supine grip five reps of neutral grip uh and i think we've talked about this before but that's that that's that's a way of getting more work out of that that group of muscles because you're shifting how the muscle is working so you're able to get more work so i couldn't just do three sets of 15 of any one of those even even on an assisted rack where i think i was doing like 70 or 80 pounds of assistance so we did so, those in high school in wrestling mm -hmm. and that's where i got it from you from but growing in the industry there's a technical term for this it's called the functional drop set where you do a similar movement and you don't change the weight because you can't change your body weight with a pull-up. You don't change the weight. You just go to an easier version of the same movement. And wide grip overhand is harder than uh, supine grip is harder than neutral grip. So, so you're 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 keeping you're, you're basically keeping the dice rolling mm -hmm. by going to an easier version. It's it's the same concept with the holy triceps, Batman, right? So you're doing you the the uh this similar concept. But let me think. A, a good one with this would be squats. You could do like a front rack re uh, reverse lunge to, to complete fatigue, then front squat or then uh, back rack reverse lunge to complete fatigue, front squat to complete fatigue, and then rack it on your back to complete fatigue. That would be a functional drop set. And then with that those, sucks, by the way, yeah, that <laughs> sounds awful. Uh, with those, I'm doing clamshells. Okay. Uh, to get to get some more uh, anterior leg work and to get the, the hip moving in a different way because what I've been doing there were hinges and I, I, I want some rotation there. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I'm not sure about because my beta test last week didn't go so well. Uh, 
then I did serratus wall slides for more serratus work, and that may have been too much for my neck. So I may I may want something else there, and then to move those serratus wall slides to the next uh, pull day. Uh, serratus wall slides. I mean, realistically, that's a stabilizer, so you could do it on mm -hmm. a push or pull pull day. And it the, it shouldn't affect my neck, but that's why I'm doing them is mm. because it does affect my neck. So well, I, they'll uh, they'll upwardly rotate your your scapula. So mm. people think of the serratus just by just as this, but yeah. they also do this. So. Uh, so yeah, if they're up, upwardly rotating that and you're fighting against it on the other side mm -hmm. because your neck is jacked up, then it might be it might be an exercise just to scrap for now and come back to it as a test later. Well, my my hope was that mm -hmm. would help keep keep those upper traps of the neck loose so that it wouldn't so that I wouldn't be, you know, doing doing a shrug while I'm trying to do a pull up, which I see a lot of and it it makes me hurt just looking at people doing that. So uh, I'll I'll have to put a question mark on that one and may or may not continue it. Um, so then my finisher. Okay, so uh, you did those alone. Which ones? The, the serratus wall slides. No, I did those with the pull ups and clamshells. Oh, oh, okay. Let me change what I was right there. All right, and now the finisher, your fourth group. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is. Okay, so yeah, you were talking about shrugging up while you're doing your pull-ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if you're stimulating those to up upwardly rotate your scapula, you're gonna act. You could actually potentiate a shrug. Okay, that might be where the pairing went bad, or you wore out a stabilizer and you couldn't keep your scap in check. Yeah. All right, I'll just cross that off for now and move it somewhere else um <clears throat> well especially since the the opener to my finisher is was a banded face pull so uh and I, and all of these on the finisher are 10 reps and the the logic here being uh things that i can do quickly and add a little explosion uh, but then the face pull, because I need it for that stability. So this isn't hard work. This isn't a band that's particularly challenging. I just want to focus on getting that scap down and then hold it for a beat before doing it again. Uh, <clears throat> and then I did uh, ball hamstring curls, kettlebell swings, and then crunches off the ball. And I did that. That was 10 reps and I'm doing two to four sets. So I, that that's generally how I do my finishers is a set range because I'm trying to gas myself out basically. Okay, so we can help you out a little bit there. Switch the swing to the first exercise in that series. Okay. That makes and then you can, sense. then you can keep it ballistics usually first, typically. Mm. Uh, it depends you can do sets where they're uh, a potentiation set where they're they're next but this is too high rep for that so but then you can keep the rest in in a, a, that order because you'll still get the heart rate effect if you go lower body upper body lower body abs mm -hmm. so so yeah i would do the swings first there uh, especially since you're using muscles you would use in the swings with the face pull and the ham curls and so in that ballistic movement, you may be having a technical breakdown that you can't feel happen because you've mm. pre-fatigued those areas. It, not a hundred percent rule, but that if you're already having some pain, I would play it safe and do it with the most optimal. Yeah. There. And then, and then doing the, the, the ball hamstring curls that gives my neck a chance to rest laying down uh while i while i uh, just engage the lower body there okay so we manipulated reps 
to go higher rep uh, in this sort of split, I would also manipulate another variable and that's tempo mm -hmm. uh, for two reasons. First of all, you're going to get more time under tension. So we're going to get more added adaptation in the tissues, especially the, the, the connective tissues. So especially your RDLs, I would recommend like a one, two, three up kind of tempo, one, two, three, four up. So you're getting a lot of bang for each rep. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that with the cable rows, especially since you're standing because you get a good pull and then let it pull you out of posture and then pull it back in. Uh, pull ups harder because it's hard to change your body weight. So sometimes you're just struggling through the set by the end. And yeah. all of any of these manipulations tend to break down by the end of the workout anyways. That's why we err on the side of main lift, auxiliary lifts, then conditioning, because you just go in the conditioning. Uh, yeah. But definitely RDL is tempo on that if you really want to bang those hamstrings. But the other reason to use tempo is you wanted to work on balance. And the more time you spend in that position, the less likely you are to just bounce in and out of that. So if you did like a single leg RDL and you focus on slow and controlled, your body's going to adapt to that yeah. a little bit better. So that was my plan on the next uh, pull day because my my primary exercise here are those dumbbell RDLs, mm -hmm. and then. But so I'm the also next... assuming on the cable row you have uh, a staggered stance, right? Yep. Yep. So because of that wrap around effect of the body, if you manipulate the tempo the external rotators of the hip are going to uh, adapt a little better just being in that staggered stance. The, the, the steps are two-legged, two-legged staggered, and then single leg. So don't have right. to get on then, one leg to work on balance. Then my first push day, which was a fun day until I got to the end, and, and then I almost threw up. All right. So, so we're, we're going a little more intensity here with the upper body, um, which then lets me do more with the lower body as well, which I need. Um, so the, my opening exercise here were dips and I did a pyramid of 10, 8, 5, 3, 3 plus. You know, with the Shaolin Master hanging weights off my nutsack. Uh, and then during the uh, during the rest periods for those, I did uh, glute march leg whip which I had never done before and I hated them. So I continued to do them. I love those. Uh, with, with, you know, adding an extra rep as I went, because longer rest period with those, with those lower, lower reps. Uh, and that I, the, the glute march part of it came along much better than the leg whip part of it. Uh, so that 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 day I noticed a, a, a bit of better leg whip control than I had been doing uh in the in the previous phase. Uh and then I did the next uh, exercise set were uh incline presses and I I hadn't done these before I don't think of 2 by 8 2 by 12. So I I stole that from the previous one the previous phase. Uh, and then I did 15 reps of goblet squats and I wanted something else there too, but I couldn't think of anything else to put there that would be worthwhile and not overly taxing. Yeah, this upper lower, I mean, a stretch that stretched something out from the previous day like a 90-90 uh -huh. stretch or something like that would fit there. Uh, anything that, di that didn't involve your deltoids, your pecs, uh -huh. or your quads. 
I mean, even that goblet squat, you probably want something between that goblet squat and the incline press again, because you're holding the weight up yeah. in front. So your, your anterior delts are being taxed at least a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my focus on the goblet squats uh, was my stance, uh, trying to get it as narrow as possible and still maintain, still be able to spread the floor and maintain pressure through my feet. Um, cause I'm not, I'm not doing enough weight there that I'm worried about aggravating my gimpy knee. I want, I want that good, you know, stamina burn in the muscles. And I also want to work that, that hip movement, uh, and, and, you know, uh, train, train the knee to track with the toe better so mm -hmm. that I don't have, you know, that one bad rep on heavy squats. That means, well, my day's done now. If anybody wants any further education on this subject. Real Fitness and Performance Channel just released its squat education video. I saw that. So, which actually focuses on everything you just talked about. External torque. Uh, let's see here. I, how would how would you feel about um, digging a lacrosse ball into my hip flexors for a little bit? After nothing wrong with that one. nothing wrong with that. That, might, that might be the way i go there okay so then my finisher here so two two to four sets of uh uh of 10 reps of uh standing uh single arm cable press uh really focusing on that and and with those i really want to focus on on the control and it, it really helps if you can do this in a mirror uh, so you can see that that shoulder and make sure you're not shrugging up there keep that you know keep that neckline keep that 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 line of your trap relaxed and neutral as you as all the work is being done you know with the chest there to push push that scap out um, and then again staggered stance so you get some cross body body blah bitty blue um and then i did alternating reverse lunges alternating lateral lunge rinse and repeat for two to four sets yeah nothing wrong with that no abs and, today uh no uh mostly because i couldn't think of what to do <laughs> Uh, I also, uh, well, you just did crunches on day one. So something rotational, so something like your pal off press, a band chop, yeah, cable chop. So, so you're already at the cables. Since I'm it. standing there at the cable, I was thinking of doing, you know, like a rotation, anti-rotation, mm -hmm. um, which for, for anyone who doesn't, anti-rotation is just holding, holding the cable out, mm -hmm. keep keeping it. So it's a, it's a, a static exercise. And, and I like to do, you know, like a number of reps and then on that last rep, hold it for 15 to 30 seconds. And for those that have just heard standing still and then doing reps, you're, as you, you press your arms out straight out and as your arms get further out, the lever gets longer and it gets harder. And then you pull it back in and make it easier. And then you put it back out, and you, but you'd never actually rotate your torso. So that's what we mean by standing still, but still doing reps. Your arms are moving to change the length of the lever which changes the intensity on the abs without actually moving whereas a chop yeah. you would create movement with your abs when i do chops i i like to do them from a kneeling stance i feel you get a lot more engagement well that's probably where that you way. should be right now because you need to get mm -hmm. your hips in order to get the proper engagement out mm -hmm. of the, the upper body when you kneel down you, you basically as you get closer to the floor you take a little bit of your legs out of it and then, so the last thing I did that almost made me throw up is I decided to uh, to uh, kill my quads, and I did, uh, I got on the bike and did Tabatas. I was trying to do one to three sets, and I did one and a half and decided I should stop or I won't be able to drive home. Probably a good idea for the first day. All right, nothing wrong with any of that. Day... Three. So I'm assuming day rest after day two. Yeah, and then a, a a 
cardio, mobility, flexibility, all that good stuff day. Uh, now this one, I haven't, I haven't tested these two days because stupid storm has uh, interrupted things. I've been spending time cleaning. Uh, so the plan here, uh, since, since I did RDLs as my primary, um, I was going to do, uh, barbell hip thrusts and I was, was not entirely sure how I was going to do them. Uh, but actually first I usually like to do legs first, but since the barbell hip thrust is such a safe exercise, relatively speaking, yes, if you're stupid, you can't hurt yourself. But, uh, I was actually going to start, uh, with my back pull, uh, because I want to do T-bar rows mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a stability component there that I don't want to fatigue my, uh, my posterior legs for, uh, and then, and then lose that stance. Um, so, uh, also, also because of the push day I did and, you know, the sitting, uh, I I try and spend a lot of time stretching out my pecs because that, for anyone who doesn't know, the tightness here is going to pull that shoulder forward, okay, which is just going to add to any tightness you're carrying up here, uh, as well as make, make those movements more difficult. So I like to pair, uh, I like, I like to pair rows with a lot of pec stretching, um, which if if you have a, a sit down job or a computer job or you drive a lot, that's just a good idea anyways, no matter who you are, because mm -hmm. uh, you do get what we call adaptive foreshortening. You're always in a shortened position in the front. So. It 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 tightens up to be used to that position. So now I'm really stable here, but it's not good for my body. And anytime I try mm -hmm. to pull in the posture, I have adapted to be shorter up in this area. So we've got to work a lot to stretch that back out into good posture. So this gives you stability in the moment. And it, it, it probably feels good while you're doing your mouse work or you're, you're driving. But as soon as you try to stand up, it's pain mm -hmm. and you'll get start getting that levator pain up the side. Your scaps get locked into place. Uh, your shoulders will start hurting with any time you have to move your arm back. So all right, so what I was doing here is still basic three by fifteen to increase the reps there, get some nice burn. Mm -hmm. um, and then here's where I would do tempo again too, up, and then slow, like like it's ripping you down, and mm -hmm. then up, and then slow going back down. Not that I want to make you miserable or anything, but I do. So something we may want to talk about next time, or you may want to do on real fitness that just occurred to me is. Uh, concentric and eccentric movement. I do because need to do something on that. Yeah, yeah, because there's 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 a reason for that because the the work is different between that contraction and that lengthening phase, and so you can it, it's one of the it, it is one of the many variables that you can manipulate. Uh, all right, so T bar rows, and then I was going to get on the bench and do a fly stretch. So for anyone, you get grab a dumbbell, like you're going to do a fly, and you just let it hang to really stretch out those those pecs. And, you know, 15 to 20 seconds to really stretch that out. And then since I'm on the bench already, to, to kind of wake my glutes up and get ready to work, uh, I was going to do five reps of three-second hold uh, bridges off the bench. Uh, cause that's, that's not enough work to fatigue my glutes. So I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not going to endanger my T-bar stance and it's going to, it's going to help wake those up and, and get them ready for the, the actual weighted exercise to come next. Sorry, I was just updating my things to talk about list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what'd you do after T-bar again? 
uh, T bar, then fly stretch for 15 to 20 seconds. Okay. And then, uh, now this is an uh, interesting one too. So I'm assuming you're laying on your back and you have weights pulling you into that stretch, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So when we're talking about the eccentric motion, uh, I use it in a sense of time under tension to increase the connective tissue and the muscle density. But also what we know from the data is a slow eccentric stretch loaded actually has a greater impact than just static stretching. So there you go. Those You can use those RDLs that we're doing for tissue development as a stretch to work your tight hamstrings. Same thing you can do here. You can stretch that chest out nice and slow. Now, the caution here is if you do it right, there's going to be some muscle damage to that. And depending on what you're doing on day four, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by having a slightly mm -hmm. weakened tendon or, or, or belly of the muscle when you because you're, you're doing heavy upper body pushes, right? Mm -hmm. So coming I in- I think I've got that figured out, but we'll see what you say when we get there. Yeah, coming in the next day and doing a heavy push after you- Now, if you're light enough and you you got five pound dumbbells or something, mm -hmm. I don't see you doing enough tissue damage. But uh, that, that's just the caution there, just in case. Now, right, if this and... was a high rep on everything phase, oh, but go with it, you know, because you'll be-, you'll be mm -hmm the next day is going to be all about energy anyways. And you're just basically going to give, be giving a double stimulus to the connective tissue to, to actually extend the healing time out hormonally. So, uh, but the, just the caution is because we're pushing strength on the upper body days. We don't want to do too much uh, connective tissue damage with our stretches. Okay. Then after the fly stretch, since I'm on the bench anyway, I just scoot down and I do, five reps of three second hold uh bridges okay so that helps warm you up for the hip thrusts mm -hmm. okay so number two is hip thrusts yeah so then my my next exercise is hip hip thrusts okay so we're we're repping through range of motion with those rdls on day one so what you could do here to have volume is we can do hip thrust pauses instead of just repping it out mm -hmm. so that would be one option you can just rep it out you can do time sets to get say i want 30 seconds of work which is normally around 10 to 15 reps depending on how fast you do your reps so you can you can increase the burn by doing time sets instead of regular sets so you got options here especially since you get a whole weekend to rest before you do those rdls again mm -hmm. yeah uh the timed reps is, I think, the best way to go. Since one of my goals here is to keep in, increasing my my endurance, uh, and I haven't done timed reps in a long while. So, uh, so what would you say? Three by thirty seconds. I would say week one and two, thirty seconds, and then try to do the same weight for forty seconds the next week. Uh, and then you see one of the differences between my GP and endurance phase versus what you see in a lot of traditional programs is a lot of people, they, they go, they start with the pink weights, they start high rep, and then they keep working down until they get to strength. Well, I am working the variable of muscle endurance. So I kind of flip that script a little bit. I do a high rep and I do ranges, the 14 to 16, because we're, we're hovering around that 15 rep range. If I can uh -huh. get 16, I up the weight. If I can't get 14, I'm too heavy. If I'm struggling in the middle, perfect. Right. So I'll do two weeks of that 14 or 14 to 16. And then I'll do two weeks and I'll try to maintain the intensity I did, the weight for 16 to 18. And so I'll do three by 14 to 16 then four by 14 to 16, where I make a decision on set three, if I can go up on weight, I try to match the week before and then make a decision. Either way, I get an extra set of volume. So there's improvement. Then I drop it back down to three sets and try to maintain that higher weight for the 16 to 18s. So I'm actually working up the endurance. And then when I go into hypertrophy, then we start working down towards strength. Uh, and then as I almost always do with a, barbell hip thrust i'm doing hip flexor stretches of some sort with that pulses or clock or something um probably probably just pulses off the bench uh so 
ele- elevate your foot up on the bench and you'll get real back deep foot. back foot. Yeah. Back foot up on the bench. And then you'll get real deep into that, that hip flexor there. Also known as a couch stretch for people that want to look it up. Now, would you pair anything else with that or just get right back to the hip flex, the, the barbell hip thrust since you're going for endurance anyway? I usually would, or... but I would like to see what you're going with next to see what I would pair there. Um, the reason I would, I say that is because I'd probably on the hip thrust, like you said, are pretty safe. So mm-hmm. I would be pushing towards a failure set. Mm. And, uh, you know, just a couple extra tips of rest, ticks of rest from doing something else. And the sky's the limit because with the hip thrust, everything from your shoulders down is uh, everything from your shoulders up is not working. So you have options without ruining your hip thrust. Well, the, the, the next uh, lower body work I was going to do was uh, single leg RDLs. Okay, perfect. So that would be what I put there. So the the next exercise set is single leg RDLs, uh, which those are definitely going to be slow because I have a lot of trouble with those. So the way the way I tend to do those is inside a rack. Um, so I have that those training wheels there if I need them. So I can reach out and touch touch the rack, uh, and, and uh, and, and maintain that position because I'd rather I'd rather have to assist myself than have to shift over, because uh, then you're you're not helping yourself. Uh, and I'm going to pair those with uh, uh, single arm pullovers. And for me, you know, high rep of a single leg, high rep of a single arm, that's enough because that's, you know, 45 to 60 seconds of work every set and you just cycle through you never stop Mm -hmm. okay and what do you finish with because i have ideas for that two and three as well that i wasn't sure with um my thinking uh was going to be alternating 30 seconds jump rope, 30 seconds battle rope, do that for as long as I can. It's not bad. Again, the, yeah, yeah, you should recover from any battle rope for the next day. Okay, so now with those hip thrusts, two options here that would work really well. You can move those pullovers to match with the hip thrusts Uh and then a single arm lat pull with the RDLs, which that could be a band pull in the same rack that you're doing the RDLs and just throw a band over the top. Or you can do the the band lat pulls with the hip thrusts. Uh But uh, you could also with the hip thrusts do a posterior rotator cuff something like no money or drawing the sword or something along those lines that that was one of the things i was kind of waffling about on on how to finish this day is do i want some kind of conditioning thing or do i want a a circuit of uh rotator cuff scap work paired with you know hip work of some sort like you know um uh, YTW with hydrants and bird dogs. There's nothing wrong with that. You would get less conditioning, but it would be mm-hmm. great for your shoulder. Uh, you could save the conditioning for day four and do that. Or you could do that if you have time after your conditioning and you will have worn out all the major muscles. So you would actually be able to mm-hmm. target the stabilizers a little bit better. That's that's probably a better idea if I'm going heavy on the pushes than the upper body pushes the next day, mm-hmm. then uh then work those uh those stabilizers. So I'll st- I'll stick with the conditioning for this day. 
A4. All right. So All right. So because I'm going heavier here and because of what I've done previously, my my primary upper body push here was going to be decline bench because I can do those heavy very safe. Uh they they don't tax my wonky shoulders nearly as much as a regular bench. Okay, and with it. Uh with it, my thinking was uh uh, scap retractions and then TKEs. Uh, the the TKEs helping stabilize that knee, but also helping warm up that quad for leg work later. Yeah, just don't do those super high rep. Mm -hmm. Since we do need a quad dominant exercise here, here next. Another good one there that gets the, the kneecap, the, the tracking of the kneecap in order is like a, a uh, ankle weight straight leg raise where you sit on the edge of a bench and, and mm. you just lift the leg like that and you keep that knee locked out. So we use them in re rehab for tracking issues. Uh, TKA is similar, but it's more taxing. Whereas that straight okay, leg Okay, I'll raise do that be, then. Yeah. And then you can use that TKE in a finisher. Yeah. Because once you once you've done some split squats or something, and then you hit those TKEs, that burn builds up quick. Okay, so uh, what I was thinking for the leg is uh, a a a very ugly circuit. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure about this what you think with my neck but i was going to do uh overhead squat uh to bulgarian squat and then i was going to do like a, a calf raise to give myself some a little bit of rest there uh or if you if i want to burn out my quads i could do the tkes there And the, the overhead squats are going to be really light. Something I got from you that's useful for anyone who's got a garage gym is get a one-inch dowel rod uh, from Home Depot. Mm -hmm. you know, I've got mine yeah, cut five, about six feet. Five bucks for a six-foot yep. section. And and, yeah. and you can use that for various warm-up things. You can also war use it for training technique because uh, you don't have any weight there. You're just working the movement. And so the, the overhead squat great for the flabby gut but then also great for working locking that position there for my neck for my wonky shoulders and not letting it drift you know to to maintain that posture uh well, it's and so, also a good exercise for working on squat technique because uh -huh. i mean if you have a mirror you can watch yourself but uh any uh out of whack movement in your squat is going to move that rod. Whether you're leaning forward too far, uh, whether you're, your hips are shifting or anything along those mm -hmm. lines, you're going to see it in the bar overhead because it's oh, going to be the, expo exponentially emphasized on the way up. The decline bench, I was going to do four sets of six to eight reps. Okay. Six and, eight. and for the, the legs here, uh, my thinking was 10 reps of all of these. So three sets of, of 10 reps of overhead squat and then each leg of Bulgarians. Um, all 
All right. And number three. Oh, and then what what did what did you think about what to do after the Bulgarians? Because I was thinking like a single leg calf raise. That's fine. Yeah, to, that works. To get a little rest. Yeah. As long as you don't lose balance because your calves are taxed. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have All another right. upper body push coming up? Yeah. So, uh, the the next upper body push was Arnold presses. Okay. And if you have the space, the way I like to do these, uh is to get up against the wall with a foam roll vertical with my spine, okay? So what I'm doing there is I'm giving my neck some support because I've got something to lean my head against, but the scap is free to float there uh, around around that. So I can I can feel that movement a lot better uh, as it as it rotates around and then pushes up. So you can really feel that scap moving, which which is the main goal of, of the Arnold press there for me anyway, is to get um get lots of good movement there. Uh I've never tried that. I'll have to try that after we're done. See how it feels. I wasn't sure what to pair with this because I wasn't entirely sure what I was gonna do with that with that leg set. So um, what are we going for here? Are we going for muscle failure in the upper body or are we going for upper, lower, upper, lower kind of a conditioning type set? I'd Is like to go for fatigue, but I don't think that's safe with my, with my neck. Uh, uh well, I was, I was thinking something, well, see what, the thing about these total body sets is it makes it difficult to mm -hmm. do single joint exercises, but you're on day four. Mm -hmm. So this is where you can do your, your tricep presses, your bicep curls, even though bicep yeah. would could be considered a pull. You wouldn't want to tax that on day three because people forget how much bicep you use in a bench press. So, but now you can basically beach body your workout to death because you have the whole weekend to recover before you do your next exercise, which the main lift was a leg exercise with relatively mm -hmm. light upper body work. So Arnold press with a tricep press with a hammer curl or something along those lines. Yeah, that would work and would be a pretty efficient circuit because I might not even have to change the weight. And then your yeah. rest exercise can be those TKEs and you'll get about a minute rest. And then I'd already talked about the finisher is going to be, or uh, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up with, uh, with stability mumbo jumbo. So mm -hmm. uh, you said wise T's eyes. And bird dogs. Mm-hmm. You might do some abs here. Mm -hmm. Well, the inverse of the bird dog would be the dead bug. What is that? Uh, I don't know if I. Let me see if I have my. Do I have that in my doc? Hey, I'll just pull one from online. Okay, I was going to do a uh, wheel, but I could do that. Did you look it up? Yeah. It's one of those times where everything actually came up the same. So what do you know? Yeah. Well, it, it's uh, it's the reason I put it there is because it's the complete inverse of the bird dog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you if you if you're in, in a bird dog with opposite arm, and opposite leg extended and you flip onto your back, you're in the dead bug. So. All right. Now you'd probably do want some harder abs in here. 
Uh -huh. But you would want to do it before your stability, your your uh -huh. mobility stability work. So either you got choices. Yeah, it's a single leg squat. So you can add it to that, that squat set after your calf uh -huh. raise. I just wouldn't do anything rotational there. But you can only load up so much on a Bulgarian that I'm not worried about your back collapsing because you did abs. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure how core intensive that would be of uh with the overheads. But with the dowel if I'm going rod, really lightweight. Be. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Do the wheel there? Yeah. And that's the great thing about these these total body high rep phases is mm -hmm. you can you can put the abs a little bit more dispersed throughout your workout so you're not spending so mm -hmm. much time at the end because you uh you're not you're not exponentially loading your spine. Right. Now, I wouldn't last, do it with your high rep RDLs, but right. you could do it mixed in with your bench and a single leg squat or yeah, last phase when my primary uh, leg push was front squats. Yeah, clearly you don't want to yeah, do no. any extra ab loading there because that's a good way to throw your back out. Yeah, in these you have more freedom in some ways and less freedom mm -hmm. in others. Like you don't want to tax your your single joint movements early in the week because you're working total body every day. And what people don't realize in these body part splits is how much of your tricep you use doing a pull-up or how much of your bicep you use doing a, during a bench press, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're, you know, you obviously don't want to squeeze everything you had to have out of your deltoids before you do an Arnold press the next day, you know, things along those lines. So, uh, but yeah, you can mix those abs within the week. So we do have more freedom there because we're not extensively loading our spine. In fact, part of the reason to go back to this phase every three or four phases is to take a little pressure off your spine for a month. Yay. I did something semi-intelligent. Go me. Yeah. I mean, realistically, any advice or corrections we made were just in the, the minute details. And most of that wasn't from education. It was just experience. Like, oh, I did this before and it messed this up. Mm-hmm. The other thing you have to uh, that that is a pain to program for is uh, especially if you're in a box gym is okay. What do I have around itself? If I'm doing some kind of a circuit, mm -hmm. I've got all right. I need I need space for this. So what what else can I do that re that requires some floor space that isn't going to mess up what I've already done? Well, and that's one of the things that it took me a little bit more uh, time to go online because I have the luxury of this and I have the luxury of being able to manipulate my surroundings to myself, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be the asshole in the gym that has every dumbbell sitting around your, Goodness, your, your yes. bench, or you don't want to be in the squat rack for four different groups of exercises in a row because someone else needs to use that squat rack to do, you know, squats. So, you know, you can't, do a, a cable lat pull and the glute ham and the, all of these things back to back to back where I can do that because I can take my glute ham machine, which is in this corner and set it right here in front of me and use this rack. So I can manipulate my surroundings to myself more. So my program was based around that because even my gym set up when I had the gym, the, the bigger gym was we, we actually had a flow to it where we started with the warm up on the floor. We went to the racks we went to these, we went to the heavy racks, then we went to these racks, then we went to the dumbbell area, then we cooled down on the floor. And the next class came in 30 minutes later. So they warm up on the floor right before you're coming in to cool down on the floor. So we had a system that flowed around the room for our group, group classes. Well, that didn't work. That system didn't work in a box gym. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I have I have to, I've been piloting this with people who go to gyms and and saying, hey, did this work? Did this group of exercise come come together or i have to think about things like okay i'm using the rack but i want another major exercise with it what's well, probably got to be a body weight exercise because i don't want them dr dragging dumbbells over to the squat racks or mm -hmm. and so that that's taken some time to adapt yeah and that was part of how this program came together is all right uh what do i want to do and then okay well i want to do this thing 
Well, I have to do that at home because Planet Fitness doesn't have barbells because barbells are scary and only used by meatheads. So yeah, and they don't even have real <laughs> squat right squat racks. They got the Smith racks. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, OK, ha, ha, what else can I do there since I'm working out? I'm doing this day in my garage. So let's take advantage of that with these various things. But also, if you need to go to to Planet Fitness you with the Smith machine for regular squats, for regular bench press, for regular deadlifts, I hate them. But you can do modified versions of that. Mm -hmm. Like, don't call it a squat if you're doing a hack squat because you're leaning back into the rack. Mm -hmm. But you can do hack squats. Mm -hmm. which if you program them incorrectly, they're great. You can do hip thrusts on one day and hack squats on the next day because they're one is almost all glutes and the other is almost all quads, even though they're both legs. So yes, you can manipulate that Smith machine. Just don't say it's the best thing for doing regular squats because it forces you into a pattern that your, your body might not be made to do. Say yeah. bench press, never do. Okay, I never say never stray away from doing bench press in a Smith machine, because when you unrack the weight, you twist. What did my shoulders do? Force into external rotation. Now I'm more likely it's, it's it exponentially increases your chance of having a pec tear. Yep. All right. Well, do you have any, any other thoughts on what we rambled about today fitness wise nope and we our video got better as we went so hopefully we don't have to do too much editing in the middle there uh but just in case that because the video was going bad there teasing for next time you brought up talking civil war stuff mm -hmm. and since uh Ulysses S. Grant said that the only two things he was successful in life was war and marriage we should maybe uh couple that with sexy time with Sam <laughs> the follow-up to part one yeah I that think, works i think it's perfect all right well we will see y'all then but next time is uh crown of swords crown of swords wheel of time oh by the way we're not your trainers we didn't give you any direct fitness advice this is program made for heath by heath with a few inputs from me because mm -hmm. i have worked with him before but he is still doing it at his own risk and if you decide to do anything we talked about here you are at your own risk so no direct advice no medical advice or any of that all right talk to you next time